Amanda's going to see you, and now Amanda's going to hear you. Amanda, Perfect. we are good to go when you are. All right, Dylan, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. My audio okay? Sounds great. Hey. All right, great. We will go ahead and get started. We'd like to welcome 2019 John Deere Classic Champion uh, Dylan Fratelli to the interview, virtual interview room here at the John Deere Classic. Dylan, it's been two years since you claimed your trophy here at the John Deere Classic for your maiden PJ Tour title. I'm sure you've gotten this question a lot in those last two years, but now that you're finally back here to defend, what is it, what's it been like this whole time waiting to defend? Yeah, it's been interesting. It's been long and slow and lots of wind up and lead up and conversations with Claire, tournament director and all the other people associated with the tournament, but I'm glad it's finally here. I think it was the right decision last year to postpone it with it being the 50th anniversary and everything that was going on with COVID and the sort of start of the PGA Tour coming back out of that, I think was the right decision that John Deere and everyone made. <laughs> well, it will be your first title defense, so I'm sure you will learn as you go on through the week, but looking back on the season, two top tens, 130 in the FedEx Cup standing, so you're on the outside looking in, but you know more than anything how important it is to have a big week, no more so than here. So just talk about your season and, and where you're looking to get heading to the playoffs. Yeah, my season's been pretty up and down. I've played well in some of the bigger tournaments, so my world ranking hasn't suffered too much, but I haven't made many FedEx Cup points, so the regular events and all the other ones throughout the season I've pretty much struggled with. But yeah, it's, it's three, four tournaments left. I guess I'm only going to play two of them beyond this, but I'm just looking at just pipping inside that top 125, getting in the first playoff event, and then from there, I'll try and bust it and get into the top 75 or 70 for the next event. But yeah, I'm just looking to do well this week. And yeah, just try and make birdies and try and conjure up some of those feelings I had two years ago. It's quite a long time ago. I played the back nine today and had some good memories coming through there. But yeah, two years is quite a long time in, I guess, a young person's life. If I'm only 31 years old, yeah, that's almost, what is that, 5% of my life, 10% of my life. That's right. All right, well, we've got a great group of media guests that will start on the call, so we'll go ahead and open up to questions. As a reminder for media on our line, uh, please keep your mics on mute and your video off until I call on you. If you do have a question for Dylan, please drop your name and affiliation here in the chat function for us. So uh, to kick us off, Matt, I know you've been waiting patiently. So Matt, um, if you want to uh, turn on your, your camera. Hey, Dylan. Um, welcome, welcome back. Um, we saw you out there yesterday, saw you out there again today, obviously, I think front nine yesterday, back nine today. Um, you mentioned the memories a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about that when you're out there, when you, you remember certain holes? And this course obviously must fit your eye because you, you played very well your two years ago. So can I talk about being back here and some of the memories that you've seen in the last two days when it comes to the Junior Classic in Europe? Yeah, I played the front nine yesterday and the back nine today. Um, front nine... Didn't have too many memories. I remember bogeying the first hole. I think it was the second round. That was the only bogey I had all week, so that was pretty memorable in a negative sense. But course looked pretty similar. It's quite firm right now. I was surprised at how firm it was on a Monday and a Tuesday. So I think, I don't know about scoring or how they're gonna play the course setup, but it's definitely gonna be a bit firmer than last time I played. Um, memories on the back nine, I think. It was cool once I got to 16. That was really where everything sort of focused in for me. I realized on 17 green that I was leading by two, but I knew by the time 16 came with hearing some chatter in the crowd. And so playing that par three, that was a cool experience today. I actually hit in the left hazard, it bounced off the green and rolled into the left hazard. I was playing a young kid, Luke, and he hit it nice and close and made birdie. But um, yeah, not many things to like focus on or try and I'm not superstitious. I'm not really looking for little nuggets here and there, but it's just nice to be back and, and have a few of those memories pop up. All right, next we are gonna to go to South Africa to Michael Sherman. Michael, you can turn your video and mute. Hi Dylan, um, you've obviously had your struggles this year. Um, have you put your finger on um, which part of your games that you're working on to so try and improve your results? Yeah, I've worked with my coach obviously intensely to try and figure it out. We've outlined short irons and putting. Putting's a major one. My putting stats have been terrible this year to be blunt, but 
I know my technique and everything related to it is pretty sound. It's more so just trying to make putts and be more creative and stop trying to be so analytical and worry about that technique. So trying to be more creative, more productive on making putts and doing drills that challenge me to, to make putts. And short irons, I just, I guess I'm driving it a little bit more in the rough now with the gain distance and I'm hitting driver more often. So I find myself in that 160 or 150 and in yardage a lot more often. So I've also focused on that, try to get that better. And in general, I'm playing pretty well. Uh, I don't think, as a lot of guys say, my results don't reflect how I'm playing. I think mental mental side, I've been a little bit distracted the last few months. I haven't really been too focused. Uh, came out of a relationship recently, so hopefully that's going to get me on a nice straight trajectory to playing the good golf again. So once that kind of clears up and I work on those two things, I think I'll be back to the top 70, top 60 player that I know I can be. Okay, next question, we'll go to Tom Johnston with the Quad City Times Dispatch. Tom? Let's try this. Hey, Dylan, welcome back. Um, I know you don't have anything to compare this to, but has it been, what's it been like having two years as the champ and then coming back now? Are those feelings, you know, of 2019, coming back or does it feel like it's taking a little bit longer? Does it feel different with that gap in there? I'll say the the feelings I get off the course, somewhat similar, like driving the same roads and seeing the Solis family staying in that same room um, and then being in the clubhouse, seeing some people here and, and just kind of doing my normal routine. That has a lot more, I guess, cognizance in my mind of, oh yeah, this is the place where I won, this is cool. I was nervous before the final round or these little things pop up, but I try to answer that question about the golf course. There wasn't much about the golf course that sort of got me excited because it's all about the fans really and the people out there in the atmosphere and those are the feelings that sort of stick in my mind. It's the adrenaline and the, oh, we got people watching, it's in the moment. Those are the things that stick with me and when you're playing a practice round with no fans, there's really <laughs> no comparison at all. So I think the day-to-day -day things I definitely have felt like bring back memories and feel pretty good in that sense. Talk about the fans real quick. Has it, what's it been like for you? You play on tour events without fans. They're slowly getting back on the golf course now. How does that affect your game and, and you know, your approach you know, on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? It's been awesome having the fans back. I didn't realize, well, we didn't realize, I think I'll speak for a lot of guys on tour, how how much we miss them and just that energy that you can thrive off having some fans and cheering you on and even just focusing you in knowing that people are there watching you I think it was cool in the beginning just logistically okay drive into the golf course play and leave and you don't have to worry about any traffic or anything but the aspect on the course trying to play trying to perform it's a whole lot better having people there and a lot more fun I think guys probably got a little bored and tired and monotonous playing week in week out without anyone watching but having them out now Last week, tons of fans, weeks before that, tons of fans, and I think the more fans we can get out, the better, and hopefully bring enjoyment to those people as well. I know I've spoken how it affects me, but I know other people are trying to come out and trying to watch golf because they love it, and hopefully more tournaments will open up. Thank you. With WQAD News, Julie. Dylan, um, I know you've never defended before, been in this position. We talked to you on media day a little bit about it, but can you talk more about your mindset coming into this week? Is it simply make a lot of hurries, put up these scores, and win? And is it different with the responsibilities of being a defending champion? I know there might be not as much because of COVID and some of the restrictions, but having to do this in these interviews and and kind of some of the other things you might have to do as a defending champion. So this is your week as a defending champion mindset when it comes to trying to repeat this week. My mindset is just to play well. I haven't really played well or contended all season, really. I've got a couple top tens or whatever I've had, but I really haven't been in contention much. So I'm just trying to get off to a good start, play well the first nine holes and get in contention. And from there, if I obviously feel some juices flowing and I'm three, four, five shots within the lead on Saturday. I think that'll be a good achievement for me. And I like my chances when I'm in contention. I think if you had to do a statistical analysis, whenever I am around the lead, I do perform well and I do have the presence of mind to do well. So my major goal is just to 
be somewhere near that lead on Saturday and try and get in contention because I know once I get there I can zone in and focus and do really well. The thing I've struggled with is just getting there within three, four, five shots of the lead after 36 holes. And then as opposed to all, you asked the question about the stuff around the interviews and extra things, it's, it's nice, it's enjoyable. I know my, most guys probably like, ugh, got to do this, got to do more media, but it's nice to be reminded that you won a tournament and people care about you and you got some billboards and you got your name up in lights. It's not often that it happens in your career, so I'm going to savor that. to Craig DeVries from PJTour.com this week. Hey Dylan, welcome back. Um, at the start of the year, and I know it's a, the, it's a stiff competition to, make, to, to finish in the top five, uh, two of the South African uh, contingent, but were the Olympics ever an allure for you? Were they ever a goal? And uh, uh, contingent that you, the, yes. the uh, <laughs> City Blue and uh, and Sanjay Amor are bypassing next week to prepare for the Olympics. What are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I wanted to make the Olympics. That was a major goal for my, for me, for my planning, and I wanted to get in there, but there have been some other South Africans who have played really well. Even if I played better or to my potential, I don't think I would have been in that sort of top two with Louis and Christian being, well, I guess Gary Kigo's just gone ahead of Christian Bizet know it now, but to get into the top 30 is what it would have taken in the world ranking. So that was a tough, tough ask if we had to go back two years ago. But yeah, I think hopefully in the next 15, 16 years, I'll have an opportunity to play in the Olympics. It's a big thing for me coming from the University of Texas where I was surrounded by tons of Olympians on the track team and swimming team. And it was something that was reminded of pretty much all throughout my four years when I had colleagues and teammates and friends as long as going to the Olympics. It's definitely a, a big career goal for me. And the approach, uh, the decision by uh, Sanjay Amen, and uh, Steve Kim to, to skip the Open Championship to, uh, to prepare for the Olympics, it kind of it elevates the Olympics to a kind of a different level. Has that, uh, I, has there I, been any reaction in the locker rooms about that? No, I haven't. I didn't even know that until you told me, so I can't speak for Sanjay and Siwoo. You'll have to ask them the question, but... I mean, that's cool that they've done that. I think that's more probably just logistics for them. They may have to go back to Korea and fly into Japan from Korea for the Olympic Committee, and maybe they couldn't have done it logistically. It would have been tough. I don't know what their decisions were around that, but you'd have to obviously get their feedback. Well, yeah, I mean, I look, I, as I understand, the uh, more than a gold medal, a medal, the opportunity apparently to uh, avoid conscription has some yeah yeah that's that's for sure I've heard that from Ben on that's obviously a Asian Games or Olympics I get to skip that stuff but I, I don't know much about Korean culture but I'm sure they're very respectful of being selected for the Olympics thank you Yeah, Dylan, you sort of touched on it. Um, you're one of a number of top South Africans uh, at the moment, 10 South Africans in the top 100 in the world. Um, does that kind of spur you on to if there's so many uh, good players around you and to even play better yourself? Yeah, for sure. It's awesome to see this next crop of guys coming through. Wilco and Garrick, I guess, are the newest additions to the top 100 and top level South African golf. I keep trying to put a finger on what it is that we're doing in South Africa that keeps creating these players and everyone asks me that question and I can't give one simple answer. There's so many aspects to it, but I, I do get worried sometimes that I'm like, oh, maybe there'll come a day where we don't keep producing South Africans. So I'm trying to invest in the juniors. I've reached out to Golf RSA or the South African golf community to see how I could help and I've done a couple I guess during COVID I did a few online Zoom chats with some of the Elite Academy amateurs and juniors just to give them some insight and I'm hoping to try and help them out even more because uh, when I was growing up it was cool to look up to those guys doing well, Retief and Ernie, but there was no real connection I had with those guys. So I think it's important to try and, I am guess, 30 years, 31 years old, get these youngsters now also sort of staying in contact with the amateurs and the juniors and trying to inspire them because I think that can only help guys move on and make it to the next level. Tom 
Hey, Dylan, you mentioned you, you don't mind doing the interviews, the press conferences. You like seeing your uh, image up on the billboards. Has that added any pressure to this week? And, and do you do anything different to prepare as a result of you know the extra responsibilities and extra exposure? Nope. I value every week just as much as the next. Maybe a major I might skip the week before or plan a schedule around it. But every tournament I'm trying to make as many birdies as I can, go through my schedule as best I can. There's no real change in that. I'm a process orient oriented guy, so everything's got to be done to the best of my ability. And if I'm not doing that, why am I even coming to play a tournament? So not same function, same level of intensity. It's all, all the same effort. Does, does the Open Championship spot spur you on anymore? Is that any added incentive this week? I don't even know. Have we got that spot back? I know they took it away. We got I guess it back this week. Yeah. I guess it's back. Um, I mean, I don't have enough medication with me for another seven or eight days, so that may be a little tricky. I'm sure they have medication in the UK as well, but clothing. I think I have enough clothes. I don't have enough warm clothes. That's for sure. Um, but. Besides that fact, yeah, I'm going to try and win, go play the Open Championship. Obviously, it's one of the biggest events we play, and I've really enjoyed the three that I've played in so far. So that that probably will be, now that you tell me that we have that spot, maybe now I'll try a little bit harder and finish first instead of second, or third instead of fourth if the top three guys are exempt already. Thanks. Just to clarify, it'll be top five. Yeah. Not otherwise exempt. And we're going to go to Richard Maspero from the um, Super Sport. My man, Richard. Richard in South Africa. Hey, Dylan, good to see you. What's up? Just to follow on uh, with Michael's question there about the state of South African golf and why it's thriving, are people asking you um, for a specific reason? Have you noticed people are more interested in South African golf now, given what you guys are doing on the world stage? And then maybe just a follow-up as well on uh, the conversations that you have with the youngsters. What are you trying to pass on to them in terms of what you're telling them back home? Um, I wouldn't say there's that much interest over here in the States about guys asking. I don't think people here realize that we have 10 South Africans in the top 100. They're used to years of having Ernie and Ratif in the top 10, and that's obviously commonplace for, what, 15, 20 years. So. They would look, oh, 10 guys, okay, that's probably normal. But obviously you and I know that's not normal 10. And probably seven of those 10 are young South Africans, guys under the age of 33 or 34. So that's really awesome in my, in my eyes. But regarding the other youngsters, uh, Wilco and Garrick, I played a practice round with them at uh, US Open. I obviously played with Wilco at the SA Open in December. Um, I just quiz them, Richard. I try and see what they're thinking and just watch them play and, and see if there's any kinks in their armor and then I'll step in and try and offer advice but from what I've seen with Garrick there's very little to to improve upon he's got a good head on his shoulders he seems very focused he seems very diligent with everything he does um, Wilco same thing I was very impressed at the SA Open with the sort of game that he has and thinking through shots and playing well I know he hits it far and I thought that was all he had in his arsenal but they're both very well-rounded golfers so I don't think there's much that I can give on the technical or the performance side maybe I can help on the logistical side or try and guide them in the right way how to manage a schedule and what pitfalls not to run into off the course but as far as I can see those guys have done great I'm not sure who else there is to worry about or youngsters to give knowledge to all the other guys seem to be around my age and have been doing it for eight or nine years so there's not much to help there and I will do a final call for questions. Um, so if you have any more questions for Dylan, please drop your name in the chat. Craig, I see your hand raised. Do you have another question for Dylan? Okay. I do, Dylan. I'm um, just wondering if uh, you've had the opportunity to uh, to speak to John Rahm subsequent to his U.S. Open victory and, and your thoughts on, on karma and and, and how that all played out. No, I haven't spoken to him. I think it's awesome that he's, he's won. I mean, he was surely the next best player not to have won a major in the history I guess and in the last five or six years but yeah that was an unfortunate event in Columbus he took it well I saw an interview where he said hey it's a rule I knew it was a rule and that's a great mindset to have I think a lot of other players would have whined and worried and oh woe is me that shouldn't have happened but he took it on the chin and 
rolled with it. I think that speaks volumes for who he is, and then it also speaks volumes for how he prepared for the U.S. Open because forgot about it, moved on. I think some people would just dwell on that for weeks and worry about it. So I think more so than karma, I think it's credit to him for actively going about it, setting his mind right, forgetting about it, and, and chasing down that next tournament. Thank you. Tom Johnston. Tom? Hey, Dylan, on that same regards with COVID, uh, the tour announced recently that uh, testing is going to be stopping uh, here in the next couple of weeks. You've been through this. You've got a pretty unique perspective of the whole thing. Yeah. How do you feel about the tour getting back to quote unquote normal without uh, any testing and the restrictions going away? I mean, I haven't obviously been briefed on all the stuff that went on behind the scenes with CDC and doctors and recommendations, but I trust the tour, I trust the policies they put in place. I mean, yeah, I haven't heard of many. Hideki got it, I guess, recently, and there'll probably be a few more guys to get it the rest of this year, but I'm vaccinated. I'm not sure what the percentage of the tour is that's vaccinated. I'm sure over 60, 70% of the employees are vaccinated, so I think it's sort of a, an after effect now. If there's a region or a tournament that's worried about it, about hot spots and things popping up, they can obviously come to the tour and negotiate and have a special exemption or maybe test on random weeks, but I don't see that happening. I think the US, what, 150 million plus have had the vaccine in the US now, so I think we're very fortunate to be in a geography and a, an area where that's sort of not a concern moving forward. Are, are you still being tested? Even though you've had it and gone through No, I, I'm vaccinated, so I'm not subject to the testing protocol for the next three weeks until the, the policy changes. Gotcha. Thank you. All right, Dylan, thank you again so much for spending time with us. Good luck this week. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Recording and whenever you're ready. Hey Nancy, thanks for